if you grew up in a church, in a, in a, in a household where you prayed before dinner, you know, maybe you heard this prayer, you know, you, you sort of like, if you were in my family, and I'll tell you a story about this in a minute, but if you were in my family, when you prayed the dinner prayer, you prayed with one eye open, getting ready to scout out what you were gonna get. You know, like where you were gonna get the best piece of meat or whatever it was. So you prayed it as fast as you possibly could. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. Or faster. You ever heard that prayer? Anybody heard that prayer? You know, you maybe yours is God is great, God is good, right? But you do it so many times, you get in a rhythm and you do it fast, you know, because then it can be over and then you can eat. And so my mom, um, after my dad was killed, my mom, five or six years later, um, was seeing a guy who became my stepfather. And so after they had been out, I don't know, three months or something, four months, she made the grave mistake of inviting him over to our house for dinner with all of us. She probably should have never done that. Like it was in the summer, everybody was home from school, and then we had everybody else living there, and the whole fam family was there, you know? <laughs> and so we launched off on that prayer like that, and Bill, not knowing any of us, he goes, listen, let me ask you a question. Could someone explain to me what you said? Because you said it so fast that I don't even have any idea what you said. And uh, so someone explained it to him, and it sounded so weird because it was just a piece of time that we thought we were supposed to fill, right, before you ate. You know, and it uh, took me a long time to get to where there was going to be some real prayer before, you know, before a meal time. I was kind of afflicted with that. You know, and it's just like, it's just like the, the whole deal when you, you, know, you put one of your children to bed. I mean, we, I still think that my parents, the prayer they taught us or that we used most of the time before we went to bed should have probably put us in therapy and maybe out of the church, you know, because it went, it went like, now I lay me down to sleep. Have you ever heard this? I pray the Lord my soul to... And here's the mother load that'll get you, that'll put you in therapy. I think back and I'm like, my parents were trying to kill us, man. I mean, have you ever thought about this prayer? If I should, God, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to snatch. I pray the Lord my soul to take. What in the world? So the two prayers I knew growing up were, you know, the deal at dinner, which I never just didn't really know what it said, but I just knew how to do it fast with one eye open, you know, like a pirate. That was like a pirate dinner prayer. And then, and then that thing of going to bed, which was terrifying. Amen? And so you sit there and you get to a point and someone's, I mean, I remember somewhere along the way, it was really probably all the way in college, I sat there in a group of people and these people started free praying. And man, I thought it was against the law. I was like, what are y'all doing? There's no form for this prayer. I never heard it. Where's, where is that? How can you just come up with these words and pray like that? This is awkward. I don't like it. I mean, it should be in a hymnal somewhere where you can like look at it and read it, right? But there they were like praying in this open prayer deal. It took a while for me to begin to understand and accept the truth that like praying is really just talking to God and hanging out with God. It can be verbal. It can be not verbal. It can be in the middle of the day. It can be driving. It can be sitting around. It can be a short conversation or a long one. It can have no urgency. Here's the part that I think is so hard for most of us. It can have no apparent urgency whatsoever. Amen? You're not going to God and going, God, listen, man, I mean, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. It's pretty much hopeless. I just came to you because God, if anybody could have any kind of an effect on this, I'll take a wild shot and say it'd be you. You know, like, 
Wow, how different it is to pray without urgency, just to kind of get up in the morning and go, hey God, there's some stuff I just want to share with you, nothing urgent, got some questions I'd like to put on to you that maybe you can begin to influence me or show me some stuff about, about my life or about the people that are around me, and uh, maybe I just want to tell you, you know, it's good to be with you today, and I just want to tell you a little bit about my day the good and not so good, and that's kind of that's the deal. I mean, it's like, it's like really that kind of prayer is so much like what AA and NA and Al-Anon know works in the sponsor relationship, amen? If you're trying to get sober and you don't have a sponsor, you're gonna struggle. And most people resist this piece of recovery mightily. We don't want nobody meddling in our business, amen? Well, sponsors, here's the newsflash, they they don't really meddle anyway, right? They don't really meddle. But you feel like they're meddling because somebody, you're giving somebody the keys to your life for a little bit to have a 10-minute talk every day, right? You're giving somebody the keys for a little while. You don't like it. That's why we, you know, we would, I mean, people forever like, well, I mean, first thing to go. Here's the first two things to go in recovery. Number one, the idea that meetings are necessary and daily. Amen? The meetings are necessary and daily. It might be necessary, but let's not get crazy. This daily thing. What is that? And then two, that I really need to spend time on a regular basis with a sponsor. Man, I'm desperately trying to find a way to go solo. And I believe that having a sponsor indicates that I got a deficiency and that there is something that is wrong with me and that I need to figure out how to graduate from that and get back on my own track. Well, let me ask you a question. Is it true, is it true that Jesus had a sponsor? He did. Who was it? It was his father. Is it true? It was all he really had too, it was also the Holy Spirit. Is it true that God, God has a sponsor? Not not to get over some bad time, but is it true that God is designed, has designed himself to have a sponsor? It is. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Is it true that the Holy Spirit has a sponsor? He does. Jesus and the Father, Jesus and the Creator, Jesus and God, right? All that is true. And see, when we think about prayer time, we gotta think about God doing that sponsoring work in us on a daily basis. And the more casual that can become, and the more, the more just you can look forward to that time together without there being necessary urgency, the better it is. And so Jesus only one time in the Bible ever teaches us a prayer. You know, like if you follow Jesus around, you will see that in all these intervals of his life, he spends time with his dad, and then he starts teaching us. Have you ever noticed that? You know, Jesus, sometimes you wonder, why does he start off a conversation in the Bible with the word amen? Because he is finishing a conversation, a talk with his dad, and now he's gonna talk to us, right? So that's going on between the two of them. But Jesus only one time teaches us a prayer, and it happens to be called the Lord's Prayer, and there are a bunch of different, um, there are different varieties of it, you know, uh, some of you are like, end with deliver us from evil, woo, some of you do forever, amen, woo, some of you do for the right people, do it forever and ever, amen, you know, but there's a bunch of options here, right, but this prayer is the only prayer that Jesus actually taught us, and he's basically saying to us, if you want to learn about about how to be in a conversation with my dad, learn from this. 
And that's what I want to get into tonight, the first part of it. Our Father, that's the way it starts, you know? Why do you think this was the only prayer Jesus taught us? Because in fact, everything we need to understand, life with God, life being in a relationship with God, what that relationship with God brings us is, is in this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, if I stop right there, are you guys aware of how many steps we just walked through? Are you aware of that? We just walked through step one, didn't we? We definitely just walked through step two. And when we get into the will part, now we're into step three. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We'll do this second part next week. God, God give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us the stuff that's broken in us, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass people that hurt us, people who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I want to do this part tonight. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to stop there. And I got another way of reading this to you that's going to sound different. Our Father in heaven, reveal to us tonight, show us who you are. And so what we're saying to God is, God, we need you to, we need you to show us yourself and we need you to show us your nature. And see, when we're doing that with God, what's happening to us is, is God is now gonna show us our nature. Well, this first part of this prayer is a problem for us. Why is it a problem for us? Because we would like to believe that by ourselves, our name is holy, that we're in charge of the show, that we ought to be put first, that we believe, whether we admit to it or not, the fact is that we believe that we are in competition with God. Amen? That's what the whole deal about step three is. If you want to get healthy, you got to realize you have been and you are in competition with God. You are trying to find a way in your life, as I am, to substitute what God is trying to give you tonight with anything and everything else. Because that's how we're wired. Adam and Eve started off the show, right? I mean, God's like, I'll give you everything you need. I'll take complete care of you. You'll need nothing ever. They're like, no, thank you. We would rather compete with you. We would rather get into the ring with you and show you, God, that you're not the boss of our lives. We are. We might come to you as a, with an assist because maybe we'll need you once in a while. You'd be a good vendor in our lives. But God, we want to run the show. Tell me it's not true that it's easy to allow God to function in our lives as a vendor. You know, we get what we need from God. And we believe that sometimes there's a payment system, right? There's a lot of, I hear a lot of Christianese uh, all over the place that kind of goes along the lines of, you know what? Christianity and karma are kind of the same thing. You, you join the choir at your church. You become a good person you don't have wild sex with someone that you're not married to. You don't get pregnant before you get married. You don't embezzle money. You don't do crazy stuff. You don't act like a crazy person. You act like a respectable, some kind of respectable Christian. And you know what? God is going to take good care of you because you're gonna earn what God's trying to give you. You'll deserve what God's trying to give you because you earned it. Man, that stops the whole conversation about grace right there, doesn't it? Because 
The problem with grace is you cannot earn it. So the karma thing is for crap. I mean, the whole, you know, the whole deal, you'll hear it on TV this Sunday. I can tell you what station. I'm not gonna, but I could. And a guy's gonna get up there and go, well, I mean, no. he'll start, the hint is he'll start off with, this is my Bible. That's how he'll start. But I mean, maybe you've heard this guy. And he'll go on to go, tell you what, basically, if you're good to God, God will be good to you. If you prosper God, God will prosper you. It's like really slick. Where does that show up in stories like this guy, Paul, who does nothing but serve and honor God, whose life as he follows God is completely jacked up. I mean, Paul sits around and goes, well, I'm just so thankful today. I have so much joy in my heart. I'm here in prison. You know, I've been shackled here for three years, but I just give God all the glory. It don't sound like my friend from Houston, Texas. (laughs) Heard of him? There's no karma. There's no karma in what Jesus has for us in a relationship with us. People stand around and go, this person in my life got sick. This happened to this person in my life. This happened to me. I was doing all right, and I know I, quote, strayed from God. That's good old talk. I strayed from God, and now God put the whoop on me. Where where do we get this? Tell me how karma connects with that cross right there. What in the world? What a sellout that is. Yeah, God's like, well, I mean, I got like, oh, God's got a golf card. And he goes, well, I mean, Mark, he parred out that part of life and he eagled that and he bogeyed, that'd be me, he bogeyed these last two. I mean, he isn't gonna have a very good day. He's just not gonna have a very good day. He's gonna go in and he's gonna want some kind of Strawberry jelly somewhere, all they're gonna have is apple. I gotta hate apple jelly. I hate it. I mean, I hate it. I don't think it should even be sold, really, but when they got nothing else, when they got no grape, no strawberry, nothing respectable, they go, whoa, we have apple jelly. It's like, are you actually gonna give that away to somebody? That's embarrassing. Karma. The problem is we want to compete with God. Even with karma, we want to compete with God because we want to find some way to realize that God, somehow we can manage God loving us. Isn't that right? If we're good, God will love us. See, what we're saying to God in that very first part, show yourself to us, show us who you really are. Show us your holiness, God. Show us your nature. Show us the depth of your love. And see, we're like, well, yeah, I mean, like, here's how we get messed up is we go, well, I mean, look, I mean, God says that, I mean, God says that we're holy. I mean, he says that we're, uh, I mean, we're made in his image. So, I mean, we, we, we can be holy. It's like, here's where you missed it is God isn't asking you, God isn't asking you to like figure it out to become a holy woman or a holy man. God is saying, I'm gonna shower my spirit onto you and I'm gonna transform your heart and I'm gonna give you an entirely new heart and an entirely new life and you're gonna be in my image, not in your image, but in mine because your image wants to fight me and my image wants to love you. My image wants to love you. And so what I need to do is help you to get to that place where you want to love me and you're not competing with me. See, only one name in that prayer can be up front in that first part of it. It can't be that God, along with my drug of choice, along with pornography, along with money, along with my own ego, along with my own pride, along with the stuff that I'm feeling guilty of along with my shame, along with the stuff I carry around, all of that is holy. You just can't have holy in all of that. It's gotta be, there's no like asterisk 
at the end of it, holy be your name, bottom of the asterisk. Well, and whatever else you want to put in there that you define as being holy. It just isn't the prayer doesn't say that. This is going to be a fight right up front. Is God going to be holy in your life? Because the holiness of God doesn't compete with anything else we want to fight with. Amen? And we'll stay sick until that piece of this prayer we realize it's just God we're talking about. It's just God. See, seeing God's nature as holy is going to require our powerlessness. Seeing God and knowing God as being holy is going to require our willingness to accept powerlessness. Have you, ever had, have you ever had, so far in your life, have you ever had God come to you when you knew you had nothing and you knew you were powerless? Has that ever happened to somebody? You knew you had nothing. You didn't have anything else to say. You didn't have anything else to think. You didn't have any way to figure it out. You didn't have any kind of a slick deal to pull out of the bag of tricks. There you were with God, and you were just sitting there with God, and you had no idea what to do, say, think, or feel next. And you know what God said to you? It's going to be all right. There's hope here. I've got this, and we're going to do this together. And that's what God said to you right there. But man, it gives you the quakies, doesn't it? You know, the shaky quakies. You get to a place of complete powerlessness, it will absolutely put you on your knees where you got the quakies. You're like shaking. If you're not shaking outside, that is a real word, by the way, quakey, sorry. No, I don't know if it is or not. But the quakies are where you might not be shaken on the outside, but you're absolutely shaken on the inside. Do you know that feeling? It's when you're almost sick to your stomach because you feel so empty that you do not know what's gonna happen to you next. And that's where God decides to come. And that's where God's looking at you and he knows you have nothing. You have nothing. And he's gonna be there. It's, it's kind of like why in... in AA and Al-Anon and NA people, people talk about a bottom. Well, I mean, some people have a bottom and unfortunately, unfortunately, some people don't. Some people don't. Some people, the bottom is gonna be death. Been there, seen that. For us to be able to understand the power of God's glory and his holiness, and his holy love for us, we got to be willing to accept the necessity of our powerlessness. Let's go on to the second part. So it says, set the world right, God. Do what's best as above, so below. So, if I believe that God is in a singular way, holy, and that it can only be God in this world who's holy, and it can only be God who's complete, and it can only be God who's fully loving in my life. If that's what I've come to understand, then I've also got to understand that when it comes to this world, when it comes to your life, when it comes to your plans, when it comes to your ambition, when it comes to your fears, when it comes to your, your belief that you're only going to be happy if this over here happens, when it comes to your agenda, the truth is this, is that when it comes to will, possession is ten-tenths of the law. Possession is ten-tenths of the truth. And so in order for you to realize what God is really trying to do with you, you're going to have to give God possession of your will, all of it that you possess tonight. You're like, that's crazy, man. I was looking to God to assist me. 
I wanted God to help me get my plans done. I wanted God to complete them. I wanted God to be my vendor. What happens if God takes my will, takes my plans, takes my idea of how I think, what if, I mean, I'm having this, let's just say you're having this massive argument tonight. I mean, I know nobody is, but let's just say you are. You're having this massive argument tonight with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your sister, your brother, your daughter, which you'll always lose that one, I'm just saying, but your daughter, your son, your wife, your husband, you're in it, you're in it, man. You're in it with a coworker and you're rattled. And you're rattled because you just cannot get them. This is a codependent's worst nightmare. You cannot get them to think like you think and to do what you believe is best for them. And you know what? They just don't get it. And here's God going, see, this possession is 10 tenths of the truth. Let's start with you. Are you aware that you don't get it? Are you aware that Susie over there or Jane or Jack or Bob or whoever, are you aware that they're really not your problem? Because remember when we were doing the first part about holiness, only me, only I am the guy that is completely holy. So, you're being all hot and bothered about what she thinks or what she does or how she does it or why they don't do it or whatever it is. You're just, you gotta go back to part one because you still think you're in charge. You still think you have something better to offer that person than I do. Let it go. Possession is 10 tenths of the truth when it comes to will. There is a true place. This guy is Emmett Fox. Have you ever heard of this guy? Emmett, you've heard of him? Emmett Fox. There is a true place in life for each one of us upon the attainment. God has a place for you that upon the attainment of which we shall be completely happy and perfectly secure. Who would want that? Who would want that? On the other hand, until we do find our true place, that will be God's place for us, we shall never be either A, happy, or B, secure, no matter what other things we may have. Our true place is the one place where we can bring the kingdom of God into fullness, into manifestation, and truly say, thy kingdom cometh. God, bring it. Bring my life that you wanna show me. Bring my life that you wanna build for me. Bring, my, bring the perspective that you wanna teach me. Bring me the next two steps, maybe, maybe the next one step, God, that you want me to take, but bring it. And what I'm gonna do, God, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna ante up and I'm gonna actually give you my will. Maybe I could do it for an hour, but I'm willing to do it. Maybe I could do it for a day, but I'm willing to do it. But God, I believe that what you have for my life is absolutely better than what I have. And I'm gonna stop fighting that. I'm gonna stop fighting that. And so the question tonight is, are you you anywhere as close to letting God take possession of what your life and future and past even look like, or are you still trying to fight him off and put yourself up on a throne? Sweet Jesus, it's a lot to think about. We have just gotten started here, and um, what kind of prayer is this? And now, maybe we see why this is the only one you wanted to teach us, because God, if we can learn anything about this, 
we're going to learn what it's like to be straight and open and available and honest with you, to let you love us. So we pray for that. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.